I won the Champions League. I won the Premier League. And I did it all with a 4-4 four, four, T lads! And this is an in-depth explanation of how I pulled it off and why it's my favorite tactic in FM23. But there's a glaring problem with a 442. There's a reason that it has been mostly abandoned in the modern game. It almost doesn't exist anymore. First, it was the 4231, then the 433, both of which offer much greater midfield control. There's literally an extra midfielder. They both occupy the spaces between the lines of a 442, which is notoriously flat. But hold on there, hold on there, we're not just hating. We're not hating, it's my favorite tactic. So why? Well, it wasn't just to punish myself, although I clearly do like pain. I play football manager a lot. I adapted a 4-4-2 to win everything because I believed it gave my team the best chance to win. Why did it give my team the best chance to win? Because I happened to be able to get my hands on three world-class center forwards. One, two, three. Now these are three center forwards who mostly didn't know how to play anywhere else and were not particularly well utilized in their skill set if I put them anywhere other than center forward. And the 4-4-2, gives me two of those spots in the starting lineup so I can use more of my best players. And even if I wanted to force them into playing winger, winger was the second strongest spot on my tactics. So I wanted two of those two that didn't have to deal with these three world-class strikers. So 4-4-2 was the only formation where these guys could get on the field together. Two talented wingers and two center forwards. It's an important lesson in football manager to build a tactic around what the transfer market or maybe your own youth intake happens to give you. And another important lesson, protect yourself online. If I didn't use NordVPN, you guys would probably already know what videos were coming out next. But NordVPN is an incredibly simple and effective way to protect yourself and your internet traffic online. For somebody like me that travels a lot, has to use a lot of hotel Wi-Fi, it is invaluable. Using NordVPN, which you can do in like two clicks, obscures your IP address by routing your traffic through a different point in the world. And this just keeps you safe from malicious people trying to track what you're doing online. But outside of the safety stuff that you might have heard before on this channel, it has other features that are very applicable to daily life. Did you get caught up in Netflix password sharing ban? Well, you can use NordVPN's MeshNet feature to run 60 devices through the same IP address so that you can all use the same password again or same account like the good old days. NordVPN is a no-brainer to keep yourself safe online, and you can get a huge discount on their two-year plan at the link in the description, plus an additional four months completely free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So do that. But back to my computer that's protected by NordVPN, we know that we needed a 442 to accommodate our load of forwards and wingers. So what do we do to counter all of the bad stuff about a 442 to allow those forwards and wingers to do their thing? Well, we'll start at the back and work our way up. And at the end, we'll get to the sneakily most important part of this whole process. But you have to subscribe to unlock it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Or am I? We're starting at the back though, because if you use two wingbacks, you're gonna die in the game. But you're gonna die. It'd be a real consumer hazard if it wasn't just in the game. Let's take a look at our title winning match from the Twitch stream against Newcastle. Now you obviously have two fullbacks. One guy on the left, who's Grantly poor, he's over there. And the guy on the right, whose name is Bahatin Yavuz, he's right there. Now Grantly poor is a center back playing left back. Not actually, he's not actually a center back. He is a fullback. He just has a center back's skill set playing left back. Bahatin Yavuz is a well-rounded player on wing back on support. Now, if the other team has possession for a long time, the distinction between a fullback on defend and a wing back on support is not going to be significant. Where it comes into play is on the counter. And if you notice at the start of this highlight, we have the ball. Now we attempt to pass forward, and then we lose the scramble for the initial ball. This pass is headed to Mateus Franche. Grantly Poor is positioned pretty well defensively. Bahatin Yavuz is caught a bit further forward. As Franche gets the ball, Bahatin Yavuz tries to close him down, but Mateus Franche makes an excellent pass, and now all of a sudden, Yavuz is cooked and the right side is open. But take a look where our fullback on defend is. Instead of diving forward or instead of trying to mark the winger, he is sprinting back to create what essentially looks like a back three. While a wingback on support is not married to their position, a fullback on defend is pretty married to their position. But the result is that obviously we're in a far better numerical situation than we would be otherwise because Grantly Poor's focus is defense first. Now, doesn't this mean that he's going to create less pressure on the left side? Well, yes, but a 4-4-2 creates so much pressure in other ways, 
that it doesn't matter. And he still plays like a fullback. If you're afraid a fullback on defend isn't going to do anything on offense, look at this. This is a goal kick from the very same match. Now, Bahatsin Yavuz is down on the near side. If you look on the far side, that's Grantly Poor. When you're breaking the press, the fullback on defend is still going to take a pretty fullback looking position. A beautiful ball gets delivered to him. He gets it onto the winger quickly and he contributes massively to our offense because we just scored a beautiful team goal, shattering their press. Now, outside of these counter situations where he will push forward for a few moments in long possession situations, a fullback on defend will act more like a wide center back, providing a drop off option for the wing or central midfielder on that side, but not venturing too far forward so that they can quickly recover and create a solid defense because two center backs is never enough for your rest defense now as for those center backs i put one on cover and one on defend on central defender if you put both on ball playing they're taking too many risks with the ball and you're going to get some awful turnovers one on ball playing is fine i honestly put one on cover just to make myself feel better i can't find visual evidence of this really making a serious impact in a way i can discern but put the faster player on cover of your two center backs and just hope that they do a little bit more sweeping against a 4-2-3-1 you can tell your more forward center back to man mark their attacking midfielder as long as you're not concerned by deeper runs from their defensive midfielders and if you do that you must really really hate the opponent's attacking midfielder passionately. Now to the midfield. On the side that we have the fullback on defend, I like to have a winger, usually on support, unless we're playing a team I think is much worse than us, then I'll just put them on attack. This allows us to have width in our attack further up the field, because of course our boy Grantley Poor back here is not going to get all the way up the field, so if this guy's cutting in or doing something, you know, else, then we have no width over there. On the other side, we have an inverted winger more often on attack. Obviously, this can be on the right or the left side. If you have a great left wing back instead of a great right wing back, then you can flip which side this is on. But for me, this is on the right side and we have an inverted winger on attack. This is the wild card player. You already have the wing back coming up behind them to provide the width so this guy can cut in. He can be a goal threat with crosses coming from that wing on the left. He should be a very good dribbler because they will end up in isolation with a chance to do something like this. No, 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 no. Oh, it's so good. They'll have a lot of opportunities to do that because with a two striker system, the two central defenders are occupied, which means isolated against the fullback, those two central defenders can't leave or else somebody else is open. If they can smoke that fullback off the dribble, there's nothing the defense can do. But the absolute key to this whole tactic is what the double pivot does in the middle of that midfield. And I'm gonna look you dead in the eye sockets and tell you something right now. If you're gonna use my tactic, this 4-4-2 right here, do not put someone on attack. Look, I love central mids on attack probably even more than you do. And if I can resist the urge, so can you, because you will shoot yourself in the foot if you do it. Even an advanced playmaker might be too much, unless you got like N'Golo Kante running around behind him. The only instance you wouldn't do this is if you're a psycho using a defensive winger. Now I've heard that they're actually pretty good, but who on earth trains a player to play defensive winger when they actually have the skill set to do that. They'd just be playing ball winner to begin with. Or they're just a fullback. Anyways, midfield. One, very deep. For me, this is a dilp, a deep lying playmaker on defend or support. You can also use a ball winning midfielder on defend or support, or a central midfielder on defend. Do not use a Carolero. This formation actually defends wide areas very well, as you can see. Then the other midfielder, which is a true box to box type player. This can be box to box, or for me, it was center mid on support. Now this box to box midfielder is the second wave along with your wing back, whichever side that wing back happens to be on, because their job is to arrive after that front four pushes everybody back. Now, Rafael Riquero is that center midfielder on support in this play. Now, he's right over there because he was just part of a triangle play in the buildup. Now, watch as the front wave of my team pushes them all the way back. And you can probably see where this is going at this point. Bing! Now, if we rewind this a bit, you can see how the deeper midfielder is going to play in this situation. They don't have exactly the same freedom, which is good. That's what you want. Max Hughes here is running and then stops about 22 yards away from the goal, which is exactly where you want him to be. He's setting the perimeter and is available to have the ball dropped off to him to try and go for a banger or just recycle the attack. But while that's clearly very pretty, offensive ability of the midfield is not the main key. The main key is the defense, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Then there's the strikers. You want one a little bit deeper and then one that is always pushing against the back line. That's advance forward or poacher. Center forward on attack, 
not good enough. Those guys will float off the back line too much because they're trying to do everything, which is great. My deeper forward is a center forward on attack, but you need somebody that is applying constant pressure on the back line because the beauty of two strikers is you end up in one-on-one -on -one situations with center backs a lot. And you want one forward dropping deeper because it's much more complex to defend for your opponent's back line. I mean, look at this. We start with the ball on our center back's foot, Luis Fonseca. He connects with our midfielder, Rafael Riquero, who then finds Dominic Kish, who's dropping in as a center forward on attack, who then finds Heiko Reinhardt. That's it. It's incredibly dynamic positioning that's dragging center backs and midfielders all over the place from a formation that is not typically known for being able to do that sort of thing. But you can in FM23. And with that, your roles are set. Now it's the instructions that really make this bad boy tick. But there aren't too many of them. You know my hatred for clicking everything. In possession instructions, we have pass into space because there is a constant pressure against the back line that you want to be able to take advantage of. Oftentimes, you'll see your wingers when you have possession for a little bit, run up against the fullbacks and then get balls dropped into them to the corner. Even if they don't have time to do this, we play with a wide attacking width so that my forwards get wider and they can get the ball over the top to the corner. In which case the wingers kind of cut inside of them. It's beautiful the way it works. You do not want work the ball in the box. In fact, you want early crosses because Early crosses in this tactic allow you to isolate center backs against your hopefully very talented forwards 1v1. That's all you want. If you work the ball in the box, you put pressure on the wings, then bring the ball back to a midfield that's not looking to make incredibly aggressive runs into a midfield that you are, quite frankly, always outnumbered in. The tempo here is tricky. If you push too much, then you're vulnerable on the counter. But if you go too low tempo, you don't take advantage of your uh, incredible pressure that you're applying immediately when you win the ball back. So I usually just left that in passing directness right in the middle. Counter and distribute quickly, I have on. If you've got somebody that you can play it to specifically on the ground, then do that. But you do want to play out on the ground unless you're going with a target forward up top. Counter pressing also too often drags your midfield way out of position when you're trying to keep them a little bit more disciplined. So I have that off. And then the trickiest part of all the instructions, where do you set the line? I have two settings here. One, lower line of engagement and lower line of defense if you're playing a team that can beat you over the top athletically and has a better midfield than you. The better midfield means that you can't press them off the ball before they pop it over the top and them being more athletic than you up top means that they can pop it over the top successfully. And if you are low, don't have higher trigger press because that's just gonna drag you out of position and we've already covered that's a bad thing in the midfield. Now you want a high line of engagement and a high line of defense if you're playing a team that doesn't have two strikers or an attacking midfielder. So a 4-3-3, a 4-5-1, those sorts of things. And of course, against teams that you are better than, but also equal to, high line, high line of engagement. The goal here is to press them away from being able to use their advantage, their entire midfield and sustained attack. A 4-4-2, we've got numbers further up the field. Their numbers are further back on the field. So let's play up there. The aggression also encourages your wingers and your forwards to get involved in closing down the half spaces, which is very helpful. Now only use prevent short goalkeeper distribution if you're not afraid of their defensive midfielder because your forwards are going to run off their center backs and the ball will get to the defensive midfielder before they can react. That guy will have a little bit of time to pass. But this all works in tandem with that sneaky most important part I was talking about right at the start of this video. The opposition instructions is where this entire tactic is made or broken. And for that, once again, we're headed back to the FA Cup final against Liverpool, who outside of us, I widely consider to be the most talented team in my Twitch save universe. Now, the way to use those opposition instructions to defend the 4-3-3 or those other tactics I was talking about, you want to tight mark the front two tight mark the double pivot and then close down the defensive midfielder. Particularly the tight mark on that double pivot is going to allow your defense to free up and stop the actual front three. Now, this is a bad pass by Grant Lee Poor that's going to be turned over by Connor Cutler. Liverpool's won the ball. Now here is their right wing, just made that excellent sliding tackle. Here is their striker and here is their left wing. These are the two central midfielders. My central midfielders are staggered because we have our deep lying playmaker and our center mid on support. Gavi, who plays for Liverpool in this universe, takes off to try and make a run behind the line as at least one midfielder is always going to try to do when there are at least three midfielders on the field. And Max Hughes, because he's starting from a naturally deeper position and I have a tight mark on Gavi, picks him up. And at one point, Max Hughes is the deepest defender on my entire team because he's following Gavi here. Him following Gavi allows both of my center backs who are here 
and here to focus on their striker, which pays off. Now, obviously, Gavi could have checked the ball back to the other central midfielder, but in which case, we have two extra defenders who can step forward to defend that while the rest of my team recovers. Now, the close down on the midfielder allows your forwards, your wingers, or maybe even a midfielder on your team to be very aggressive in taking away that space so that they can't just sit there and chip the ball over the top of you. And if you have a passive 4-4-2, that's exactly what they'll do. Now, watch as the ball's knocked down to their defensive midfielder and the speed at which my team reacts to it. That's not a lot of time to get the pass off. And this is just what I love about the 4-4-2. Look at the situation if we win the ball. It's 2v2, baby. All day. The last instruction, most of the time, the center forward in a 4-3-3 is dropping in. So you want to have not type mark ticked. The red one, not the green one. So that your center backs don't follow them in and can stay home to help pick up those runs from the wings. The other formation you run into a ton is a 4-2-3-1. And for this, there's actually a lot less to do outside of all of the lines adjustment and the instructions, of course. The only thing I typically do is close down an attacking fullback, but because a 4-2-3-1 is so naturally behind the midfield to begin with, there isn't as much time for your midfield to recover from following a deep tight mark, and they're just gonna give up too much space in the middle of the field. A higher line totally still works here, especially if they have a deep lying forward that you can tell your guys not to tight mark, but you are very vulnerable vulnerable because those wings are starting so high up the field with a number 10 to distract everybody in the middle. But because those wings are high up the field and you also have an extra fourth player up there to distract your defense, you're very vulnerable to balls over to the corners. So if you're giving up those passes from their defensive midfielders or their maybe two central midfielders, you can close those two guys down if that's what's blowing your press open. But I love this tactic. It's an exciting tactic that scores loads of goals and allows you to put a ton of attacking talent on the field at the same time. And if you want to download it, the link's in the description. Also, check out this video. If you like this discussion of tactics, tips, and stuff, these are common mistakes that are made by people playing Football Manager, and it has a special guest in it who is a Football Manager genius. So, worth the watch. How many times can I point?